I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you're blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. Uh, what, I, what I prepared for today is a bit in line with what Pastor Josh has been preaching uh, for the people who are for the first time. The year theme is launch. Not lunch, it's launch. So, but before a rocket can launch, because Pastor Josh got a vision of a rocket going up, it needs a good platform. And that's what I want to speak about today. Prepare the platform so that we can come to the point that we can launch. There comes so much power when a rocket goes up. It's incredible the power which comes on the platform. So how steady and strong that does have to be. So that's what we go for, yeah? We start in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and then we look actually at the conclusion. John is saying some things, and then this is his conclusion. He says in verse 18, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And another Another translation says, the son who is at the bosom of the father, he rests at the bosom of the father, which means he knows God's heart. Now, I really like this scripture because it says Jesus showed us God. Amen? It basically says, if you want to see who God is, look at Jesus. Yeah? But at the time John wrote this, it was not really welcomed by everyone this verse. Not everyone was happy with it. By the way, is there anyone interested to see God today? Amen. Let's go for it. Because it says, you can see God, you can get to know God. Look at Jesus. But you know why they were not all happy at that time? Let's look at the verse before. It says in verse 16 and 17, for from his fullness, we have all received Grace upon grace, now oh, that's still good news. When Jesus came, it says he was full of grace and truth, and we have all received grace upon grace. How cool would it be if you meet God, if Jesus is in the room, what do you expect from him? How cool is it that it says we've all received grace upon grace? So whenever he healed someone, it's what, it was not by merit, they didn't deserve it, it was by grace. Whatever Jesus did, a big catch, the multiplication of the, of the bread, all the things in the gospel, it was grace upon grace. But then he says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And this is why they were not that happy, because the next verse is, no one has ever seen God. And that can be quite offensive, because they already had the law. They had the law of Moses. They had the biggest part of our Bible. The biggest part of our Bible they had at that time. And they studied it. They know it better than me. <laughs> by the way, Pastor Cabello, did you just did that by head, that quoting of Psalm 91? My goodness. Um, I doubt my title. <laughs> Please lay hands on me later, brother. I... <laughs> But imagine, imagine that you're a lawyer and you studied many years to be a lawyer and you practice law for 30 years and someone steps into your office and says, well, I have news for you. You didn't understand anything from it. How would you feel? It's quite offensive. And that's actually what John was saying. No one has ever seen God, not with three quarters of the Bible, not with all your knowledge. No one has ever seen God. It took Jesus to understand who God truly is. So you can know most of your Bible and not know God. Now let's see how that works out in practice. You know, this is all theory, may be a bit dry, but look, look how that works. The difference between Moses and Jesus in a practical situation. We go back to the story which Pastor Josh also has mentioned, where the woman who was caught in adultery 
was put in the temple. You know, it's, Pastor Josh spoke about Jesus bowing down two times, writing. We go back to that situation, and then you see how Moses and Jesus are put beside each other. Let's see how it's written in John 8. We start in verse 3. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? You see, Moses has a voice, and now we wonder, what does Jesus say? For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now we're going to see it. And what does Moses say? What does the law say? Stoner. And now is the big question. And you, Jesus, what do you say? And, and then comes that moment where Pastor Josh preached. You know, if you missed it, please watch it back. The first two on launch. And then there comes a whole conversation. So Jesus is actually very clever because he's the one who wrote the law. And he tells them, let, let the one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. And then they end up all walking away. Because it, who is without sin? He says, so yeah, you might have caught her in adultery and it might be in your mind like, oh, such a bad sin. It's always remarkable, by the way, how the women get oppressed more. Where's the guy? I mean, if one is caught in adultery. Interesting, huh? So it's like, it's like the law picks an easy target. And by the way, did you note that it says that the woman was put in the midst? Now, that's actually very essential. The law puts you in the midst. Especially in the temple, in religious environment. The law puts you in the midst. You know, and then Jesus says, let, let, let those of you who is without sin cast the first stone on her. And they all walk away. And then we draw back in the story. And then the Lord says, and remember, what did we say? The law says stone her. What do you say? And now we go to what Jesus says. Are you interested? Because you know what's the difference? The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came to Jesus. No one has ever seen God. But only the Son has made God known. So what does Jesus say? And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. He just said to her, Has no one condemned you? And here you have, What do you say, Jesus? I do not condemn you. Wow! Moses says, Stone her. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you. That's why they didn't know God. They said, it's clear, clear situation. Woman, adultery, law says, stone her. And then Jesus came with grace and truth. And he says, has no one condemned you? None of the people actually had the right to condemn you. There's no one without sin. Well, I have good news. Neither do I condemn you. Well, he was without sin. And yet he did not condemn her. Read it with your own. With your own eyes, what's the difference between law, between Moses and Jesus? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I'm the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. The life, light of life. Now, when we read this whole thing, we still often get confused again. Because Jesus says, I do not condemn you. And then we hear in our inside, but, 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 but. Now go and don't do it again. Is it, is it, I, I'm like that. That's how I read it. But that's almost like, okay, this one time you get away with it, but now I have an eye on you. Don't dare do it again. <laughs> that's how we, how we function on the inside. Or is it only me? That's how we often think. But then he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me 
will never walk in darkness. Did you know that that came after this part? Why is he saying that? Could you say adultery is darkness? But also accusing one another while yourself with sin. Wanted to stone one another. Could that also be darkness? Yes, that's all darkness. And then Jesus says, you want to be without darkness? Anyone interested here? That, your, that darkness goes out of your life? And what we often think, oh, I got away this one time, there was grace, maybe two times you get away, but now I have to keep the darkness out of my life. Run, 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 help. But what's the way to get darkness out of your life? Have the light. Amen? This, is there an other way to get darkness away? Think, think practical. Well, you guys know a bit about darkness. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> but what's the way to fix it? Put the light on. So what is Jesus saying? How do we deal with darkness in our life? He says, follow me. Be with me. Then you will never walk in darkness. Wow. Wow. So he doesn't say, neither do I condemn you. Now go back to your own strength. Now you don't do it no more. But we're going to dig in a bit further. Because we have the tendency to hear this. And with the worship and uh, in the corporate anointing, we're all like, oh, wow, Lord, you're so great. But then we go back to our lives. And then when we do something wrong, we often start struggling with guilt again. And then we realize we shouldn't have done that. And instead of drawing close to Jesus, we walk bowed down, feeling bad about ourselves. And that's not what Jesus wants. When it says, no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son, the one who rests at the heart of the Father has made him known. You know how that says in normal language, God loves you too much to let you walk around like that. And he knows we're weak. He knows we're all born in a sin, 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 sinning body with tendencies which are not correct. He says, and I, wanna, I want you to have the solution. And the solution is not in you. It doesn't come from you. The only solution is Jesus. He's the so you know, my, the, the one who taught me grace, Pastor Prince, has such a beautiful example. He says, we're, we're just strange human beings. He says, if we're dirty and we see a bath, we says, yeah, but that bath is so clean, I cannot go in there, I'm dirty. Let's first take a shower. <laughs> but Jesus is the bath. But then we think, yeah, but we're dirty. But the bath is to cleanse you. You don't have to clean yourself first, just go to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to look a bit into the law, and then I need your help. I want you to count something. We're going to look into what they call the constitution the, the, or the stipulations of the law. And then I want you to count the thou shall, you shall, you shall, yeah? I made it a bit shorter. If you want to read the whole thing, go to Deuteron Deuteronomy 5. And I made it a bit shorter because I want us to get the you shall, you shall. Yeah, are you ready? You ready? It's, got, it's a bit of a read for a Sunday morning. This early, but it's about the counting. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. He counts ten. Nine. It's actually nine. 
But you know why it's nine? Because the one about the parent says, honor your father and your mother. But you could also say, do not, you shall not dishonor your father and your mother. So if you take all the law, it's ten. And what's the key in the ten? You shall. You in the midst. Did you see, by the way, the you shall not commit adultery? That's the one they said. Moses says, so this is not the complete law. This is the stipulation of the law. And when you break it, there's a whole set of punishment. And with adultery, it's stoning. But the whole key of the law of Moses is you shall. And John says, in that concept, you don't get to know God. Why? Because it's almost like an unfair commandment. Because God already knows you cannot. <laughs> no one can. Later in the, in, the, in the New Testament, James says, if you break one law, you break them all. So the law is not even 10 things you need to keep. It's a, it's a composite whole which represent holiness. So why can no one keep it? That's why Jesus said, anyone who's without sin, he actually says, yeah, let's compare adultery with small sin. It's sin or no sin. Is there anyone here who think, but I can manage that? No. No one, if we're all honest, no one can do all of that. And trying actually gets you blinded for who God is. Shall we look at the new covenant? Because this was Moses. This was Moses. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And you know, with Jesus Christ, there also came a stipulation. There also came like a constitution. It's very interesting. See if you see the difference. The difference compared to Moses. What was the main thing which we just read? Thou shall say, I have to. Say it, I have to. Yeah, so when you're dealing with Moses, it's I have to. And now Jesus comes. We read from the letter of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 10 to 13. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This is the Jesus covenant. And you know, what was the most hurt thing in this? I will. What did Jesus say? I will not condemn you. Wow, what's the difference? And Moses says, thou shall and thou shall not. The burden is on you. And in the new covenant, Jesus says, I will, I will not. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, it's quite tough for us human beings to walk in that. Because we have so have the tendency to go in our own strength and our own power. So what God wants us to learn on our inside is to rest in him. Rest in him. In your heart, rest in Christ. Because Christ is also in you, the Bible says. And whenever something goes wrong in our lives, we have the tendency to think, oh, guilt, shame, and we get flooded in our emotions. But Jesus says, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Do you need to solve this or is the, is, the, is the new appointment we have? I will. 
Is it thou shall or I will? It's I will. With Christ, the Spirit came and He works from inside out through us. So whenever we are ashamed, you know when we have communion that it says bring in remembrance. Bring in remembrance. Why is that? Because our memory is now in the here and now. But then Jesus says, but wait a second. I said to you guys, for I will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's why we bring with the communions the work of Christ in remembrance. To cleanse our memory again from what's in the here and now. Hello? So God wants us to learn to live in grace upon grace we walk and we get grace upon grace grace upon grace it doesn't stop with two times grace upon grace and then God ran out of it then we go back to Moses now from here it's thou shall no the grace upon grace principle is that grace keeps flowing grace keeps flowing grace keeps flowing grace never stops Jesus never runs out and that's the way to live for every situation, for whatever, for, for your own wrongdoings, for things done to you, whatever you need. God says, I have grace upon grace for you. When Jesus appeared, we all received grace upon grace. So what the law does, thou shall, is putting a demand on you. Yeah? The demand is on you. You need to come up with something. By your strength, you need to try not to sin. Grace says, or Jesus says, now you have to receive. You realize it's opposite? It's demand on you, or now you have to receive. But we all have problems to receive. When I come to you, oh, I have a gift for you. No, 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 no. When God comes, I just love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really know what I did yesterday. God says receive, because it comes by grace. But we have such a challenge as human beings to receive. While well, God says, get to see my love, get to see my grace, get to see Jesus. The name Jesus means God saves. Not you have to save, shave yourself, you have to shower yourself before you go to God. We have to learn to stop all that and boldly come when there's a problem. Yeah, but there's darkness, how can I come to God? God doesn't see me. Well, guess what, God is light. But we're expecting to condemn. We're expecting to be ready with the stone. If I come with that, with that black, with that darkness, I come to God and he'll judge me. No, that's Moses. When I come with my darkness, even when I come with my addiction, yeah, but I started it myself. And I even heard the Holy Spirit say, don't do it, and I did it. And then we think, now we better stay away. No, God says, come, because now you come in the light. And that will deal with the darkness. It's really wow, the gospel. I hope it's that you're thinking that it's not lack of excitement, otherwise I get a bit insecure. <laughs> it's so incredible cool, but we fear it almost. Really? Is it really like that? You know, and then when I say, yeah, it doesn't mean that you now have to be busy with, oh, I shouldn't sin anymore, I shouldn't sin anymore. Even then, even then, some of us have, ooh, you make it so easy now, because Jesus said, I'll not condemn you, but now go and sin no more. But that would be going back to the law. Well, Jesus said immediately after that, just follow me. Stick with me. <laughs> Shall I help the concerned one amongst us? And to be honest, I was one of them, because I'm a pastor. Yeah? I'm a pastor. So as a pastor, you look at your, at your sheep, and you want them to behave well. You know why? Because the people out there also see the sheep. And if the sheep misbehave, they think, what a pastor. So that's a bit of an ego thing <laughs> from the pastor. <laughs> so then, then when you see something like that, I will not condemn you, but now go and sin no more. That's a bit like, okay, we can be gracious in the church, but hey, come on, sheep out there, behave. <laughs> Otherwise you make me look bad. Don't do that. But then you get back on the law. God doesn't want that. Does anyone want relief of that? God give me relief of that by one Bible verse. It's in Romans 6. 
And sorry for the, for the projection, I switched them again. Romans 6 verse 14, it's an unbelievable verse, if you get it. Sin shall, sin shall not have dominion over you. Anyone interested that sin loses its dominion over you? Yeah, everyone? Imagine that the power of addiction and attraction and all of that stuff which makes us feel like I want to drink, I want to use, I want out, I want to move, I want all of that. The power of that. If you want that to lose dominion over your life, that can be. And then there's one requirement. And Romans 6 says how? Listen to this. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Shall I say something crazy? It's actually under law that sin keeps its strength. Oh, now we really get to the edge. <laughs> now it's really like, oh, what are you saying? Yes, it's not only that we have to receive grace, we need to remove the law. And that doesn't mean we don't have rules, we need to remove the self-effort, the demand on us, the thou shall, the guilt, the shame. Because all of that actually keeps us stuck in sin. That's why it doesn't say, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under grace. It doesn't say that. What does it say? Sin shall, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's why under the law you could not get to know God. You only get to know yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you ever got to know yourself, but it's, it's not really good. <laughs> I thought I was quite good, till my wife got honest. <laughs> and now I have two teenagers. Now I really realize it's not that good. <laughs> but praise God, we are no more under law. We are put under grace. And sin loses its dominion under grace. And you know, this even works with, the, with faith. This is a faith church, and I love that. The Netherlands have predominantly rejected the faith movement. Well, that was a legitimate move of God. That is a legitimate move of God. You need faith. If the rocket needs to launch, how are you going to do that without faith? This, this, this nation requires faith. Your electricity net requires faith. <laughs> your your health care requires faith. All requires faith. But the point is, if we do faith in our own strength, it works like the law because Paul says the law has a certain glory. It's like you have a little bit result, then it gets flat, and then it crumbles. Is there anyone who has been frustrated about your faith life? It's because it didn't have the foundation of grace. If it fails, I just go to Jesus and I receive more grace, and now I can believe again. So... And even if you apply the faith principles and God is in it at the start, then you see it work. You know, I speak the word, I believe the word, I hold on to the word, and then you have a certain result. But somehow we're all so human that, and it happens with me, that somewhere along the line I took over. I allowed to, the yoke to be put on me again, to the demand on me, and now my faith doesn't work. Why? Because it all comes by grace. It's by grace through faith. You cannot, if you separate grace from faith, it becomes obsolete. It becomes dysfunctional. It's paralyzed. Interesting. In the Bible, it just says that sin loses its dominion. So, what did Jesus say? I will not condemn you. Now go, if Jesus says to you, listen carefully, this is, this is actually the key. Jesus says, I will not condemn you. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1, those who are in Jesus Christ will not be condemned. There's no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? But if Jesus says that to you, if you can receive that in your heart today, I will not condemn you. If that's power, it's not just words, it's not theory, it's not in your mind. Jesus says to you today, 
I will not never condemn you. And you believe it, now you will go and sin no more. Because you walk with him. That's the key to that verse. If, the, if that no condemnation, that grace life becomes power, you will, sin will lose its dominion and you will go and sin no more. And even when there is sin, and then I mean, we all have mistakes, we all go through life, you will not live a sinful lifestyle. You will not get stuck in sin. You might here and there fall as all of us do, but because you live with Jesus and you receive immediately grace, you rise up and it's behind again. Amen? That's what God wants for us. That's what it means. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth, the truth about God, that you can live at his heart as Jesus did. Know his heart for you. He loves you so much that he was, doesn't want the demand to be on you. He says, let the demand be on me. And in the next verse, because you might all think, yeah, but this is, this is not righteousness. How can we get away with sin? How is that righteous? That's why I have another verse. And uh, Pastor Cabello, would you come up and help me? Listen to the verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. This is about God, how God did it for us. It says, for God, he, which is God, made him who knew no sin, who was the one without sin in the situation with the woman caught in adultery? Jesus. God took Jesus and who knew no sin and he made him to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is such a secret. If you forget the rest, you know, you know, I, I'm, still, I'm still laughing because Pastor George makes us do rocket science. <laughs> but if you forget all the rest, but you, 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 you remind this part, then you actually have the core of the core of the gospel. God took Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us with a consequence. So you know what that looks like. Now imagine that I'm the sinner and uh, my wife and my daughters are saying now, amen at home. <laughs> 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 but what did God do for me? Marcel, his, his son, the son he, he wants to live with in close relationship. He took Jesus and made him to be sin for me. Now, this is, this is me. This is me in my sin, in all my weakness. And what God did was he took Jesus with all reverence, Pastor Cabello, you're Jesus in this case, and you go in my place and push me away because I'm also here. You push me out. Yes. And then God took Jesus and he took my sin and he made Jesus sin for me. That happened at the cross. You spread your arms. So at the cross, my sin and your sin from your whole life, God took and put it on Jesus. And we know that. We say that in the church. Jesus died for our sin. But that's only the stipulation of the law. So when the sin was on Jesus, all the thou shall, thou shall not was also released on him. God kept the law on Jesus. And all the punishment for every single sin, small, big, whatever you think, if there is small and big, complete sin and all the punishment for it was put on Jesus. He actually took the stoning of the woman. He spoke the woman free because he know I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. And what's the ultimate penalty of the law? Death. Did Jesus die? Yes, he died. He died. So, 
Why does shame and guilt make no sense for the believer anymore? Because the possible consequence of your sin was already on Jesus. You don't have to feel ashamed or guilty anymore about it. He says, just come, come. Let me resolve the darkness in your life. Just come. So all was done by Jesus, but that was not all because I'm pushed out of my position. I'm pushed, but where am, where am I? Am I already floating in space? If he took my place and he pushed me out of my place, where am I left? I'm left in his place. Amen. That's why it says, that's, yeah, I know you're strong. I, I, I know, by the way, what this man preached last week here. I thought that was a landmark message even for the nation. It's unbelievable. It's like the runway. If, if the rocket was a plane, then he made the runway last week. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'll, I'll call you back in a bit. Let's see it again. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become, say, I might become, the righteousness of God, the Holy One, the declared unguilty. Why? It's in him. Say, I'm in him. Would God ever punish Jesus again? No, because he took all punishment and he raised him from the dead as a proof that it's solved, it's finished. The old covenant is taken care of. All the thou shall, all the thou shall not, including all the punishment if you don't, if you do. If it all goes wrong, it was all on Jesus and his resurrection is proof that it's taken care of. It's done. And now we are in him. And if a, if, a punish, if a sin is punished, can it be punished again? No, it's done. And you put in him. So you're really free. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. And all the fears we have, don't you make it too easy? No, it's not like that. It's not like that. But you know, you know how our conscience works? We don't realize how we function as human beings. I certainly not. I'm a man, my goodness. But what, what you understand from the Hebrew letters, that if you still go back to sacrifice for your sin, and that's actually coming back and say, oh, no, it's good to come, but not with guilt and shame, not to try to first shower. Come, it'll be lifted from you, all the feelings, all because in Christ it's already solved. You stand righteous before God. But you know how our consciousness works? If you put thou shall on your conscience, you will sin. And then your conscience says, oh, I shouldn't. And the problem is that makes you sin again. If you walk around with I should, I shouldn't, you will sin. And you know what happens on your conscience if you put there no condemnation? You're forgiven. The blood of Christ is sufficient. You're now a child of God. You know what happens if you have that on your conscience? You just don't sin. You stop sinning. We think for safety, let's keep the law also there. God says no. You know what? We know what may be the worst, not even that we punish ourselves, but when we walk around with thou shalt, thou shalt not, we often see it with others. We're looking at others, oh, that's not, oh, that should be punished. But the problem is then you will also fall yourself. But imagine a church environment, a family, where we stop that, where we don't know each other anymore after the flesh, the Bible says. Now we're sons and daughters, we're holy. You know that even then we stop being ashamed of our sin. So if we're stuck in one, we actually come, say, I have a problem, I'm addicted. Now we hide it often because we think they're ready with the stones when I really say what well, that's going on. No, if we have a church environment where grace rules and that's the platform, the platform for the launch from our rocket to come in that space where we just fly and reach the world. Oh, it's so challenging to us. You know the woman at the well? 
Jesus meets a woman at a well and she's a five times divorcee. Five times divorced. Anyone here? <laughs> the brother is looking back like, is there a hand? <laughs> but you know what's worse? <laughs> she was at that point even living together with someone, so she didn't bother to marry anymore. And she meets Jesus. And Jesus starts to speak into her. He just starts giving living water, living water, living water. And then she goes to town. And she starts saying to the town which hated her because she was the one that every woman had to get her husband inside when she came into the street. <laughs> and she starts to testify in the town. And you know that says, and the whole town went to see Jesus. If we give grace to the biggest sinners amongst us, they become evangelists. And I struggled with that as a pastor, with that story. Because I say, if someone meets Jesus, and now she goes out to testify, but she's still living together with the guy. You know what my concept was? She first needs to go home. <laughs> I'm honest, yeah, here, I'm, I'm vulnerable. <laughs> Is that graceful pastors, I hope? <laughs> but I thought she first need to kick that guy out of the house or pack her back and leave herself. But you know what the Lord said to me? And how would that be a testimony to that guy? You know, Lord, the Lord is not interested to condemn people. He came to save the world. And if we dared to take the gospel so radical and trust that grace will be sufficient, and all our fears, but what if, what if, what if, what if? If we dare to bring that to the Lord, you'll see a greater work being done through this church, even greater than it was. Because it is already to me, in the Netherlands we had nothing ever like this. It's already mind blowing. But God always goes from glory to glory. Amen. Last verse. Therefore, having been justified by faith, here God asks you to believe it. Believe it. Step in that place of righteousness. Then having been justified by faith, use your faith first for righteousness. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith. And then it comes into this grace in which we stand this is our foundation this is our platform this is from where the rocket can launch and keep going up without or fall over because if we mix it with the law it'll always it might not even launch for some of us but even if it goes up and it comes in its own strength we'll never get there but here it says I, 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 by faith into this grace in which we stand and then it comes that's the launch and rejoice in hope of the glory of God if you dare to stand in grace you can already rejoice in the hope of the glory of God the glory itself will come down if we stand in grace if that's the platform the rocket certainly can launch. And that's the glory of God being seen everywhere. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for joining us today. And we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed. Amen.